Number one documentary series on Prime Video introduced millions of people all over the world to one of the most mysterious cults in America. But for those of us who grew up in the IBLP cult, it was really just validation for what we already knew, that this was a sinister, exploitative organization run by a uh, dangerous, predatory monster by the name of Bill Gothard. Welcome to Surviving the Shiny Happy People Cult, live in Austin, Texas. We are live streaming from the Comedy Frequency Studios in the bunker on Brazos, and we're here with a fantastic studio audience. Y'all make some noise real quick. <laughs> Little inside joke. This is the second time we've done that. <laughs> we didn't go live the first time, but I uh, I believe we are live now. Yes, we are definitely live now. Thank y'all so much for being here with us. Uh, as we all know, uh, all ticket sales for this event, as well as uh, the super chats in the live stream, are going to benefit RecoveringGrace.org, a phenomenal organization that helped a lot of us uh, as we were either trying to or had already escaped uh, the IBLP cult. And speaking of which, we have some very special guests in the studio. Please help me welcome my co-host and very good friend, Bryce. Everyone make some noise for Bryce. And we also have one of the guys responsible for taking down Bill Gothard and crippling the IBLP cult. Uh, he is the co-founder of recoveringgrace.org. Please help me welcome John Cornish, y'all. Everyone make some noise, yeah. We also have joining us remotely, Miss Lindsay Williams. She was one of the primary contributors to the documentary. Everyone, please make some noise. Go ahead. There were a few folks that were really antsy to start applauding. I see you there, bro. <laughs> for, so for this episode, what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be sharing our experiences growing up in the Shiny Happy People cult, including trips to the cult compounds. Uh, and encounters with cult leader Bill Gothard. Uh, more importantly, we're going to be answering a lot of questions, questions we've received uh, uh, on, on comments from YouTube, questions from the live stream, and of course, questions from our studio audience. And we'll be doing that uh, towards the end of the live stream. We're all, we'll also be talking about some of the feedback that we've received, emails, DMs, letters. Uh, so uh, looking forward to a very exciting episode. Uh, to start with, though, I wanted to give kind of a background of IBLP, the shiny happy people cult. Uh, for those of y'all that don't know a whole lot about it, I know everyone in the studio audience knows exactly what I'm talking about. But for those of, uh, of you on the live stream, just wanted to give a little bit of a history about IBLP. One of the really common questions that I get from, from folks when I tell them that I grew up in a cult uh, is, oh, what church was it? Uh, that, that, that's always where it goes because people are used to fundamental Mormons or Jehovah's Witness as a cult. But IBLP was very different because it wasn't a religious organization per se. Uh, and John, you've got a perfect way of summarizing this, so I'm going to let you kind of give that background. Yeah, no, t totally. So I, I, all my life up until this documentary, I try to explain to people how I was raised. And, you know, it's always that question of, do you use the word cult? Do you not use the word cult? And people are like, well, well who was the leader? And you say, Bill Gothard. And Everybody goes, Bill Gaither? I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> no, he, he, he's saying, Bill, Bill, did, Bill did not sing. His music was way cooler than Bill Gothard's music. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the thing about IBLP, technically it's a parachurch organization, so it's not really accountable to any um, denomination or structure. It was kind of basically the, the cult of Gothard and everything he built, starting with the basic seminar, going on to, to, to develop IBLP and then ATI, and going on from there. So really it's just a, it's more of a mindset. It's a, uh -huh. I mean, he built it as a, a new approach to life. And I guess that's kind of what it was. It was an approach to life. Yeah. Um, loosely based on Bible verses mixed with some prosperity gospel mixed with some fundamentalism mixed with a lot of crazy. So a lot of crazy, a lot of, so, <laughs> a lot of crazy rules. Uh, totally. I, I mean, that's, that's what we all experienced in this, in this cult. Uh, women always having to wear dresses. And if you weren't wearing dresses, that was sinful and immodest, mm -hmm. right? You couldn't listen to rock and roll music. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't date. You were supposed to save your first kiss for marriage. Uh, and that was one of the things Bill Gothard always bragged about, that he had never kissed a girl, uh, which is just the weirdest, weirdest verbiage to use. You're an adult. You're like 70 years old, dude, and you're still <laughs> talking about never having kissed a girl. Uh, but yeah, it was really the rules uh, that uh, that they used to control people. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, I, I think what it was is people, especially in the 70s and 80s, I think back to 
to my parents and and the, the, all of our parents that those of us that were raised in the program, it was a time of real cultural upheaval. Um, I know my parents came from from a lot, of, a lot of trauma and some some brokenness in their homes. And here's a guy that's promising, you know, answers, clear, follow these steps, things will work out. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a as a dad now with two kids that are, I want my daughter starting high school this year. I, I completely understand the desire to like. How do I do this? Right. How do I do it? I can right. throw together seven steps for you. I mean, I've never had children, but that makes me uniquely qualified. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the most qualified, Absolutely. apparently. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And 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 so that uh, just a general overview of the documentary as well. And uh, you know, for those of you that have not seen the documentary, really, it focuses on the Duggar family mm -hmm. and the scandal that they went through with their their oldest son. Um, but I really loved how the documentary made it about the Duggars initially, but then kind of pivoted, pivoted to explain, well, this is the environment that they grew up in. Yeah. This is what they were dealing with. Yeah. And this is, uh, you know, what was taking over the homeschool community and, and in large part, the evangelical community at right. the time. Right. Well, and, and I think it was 2020 that, that the, one of the, the director of the documentary reached out to us, Recovering Grace, kind of telling us about what she was thinking. And I got to saw her see her original pitch for the documentary. And it was nothing about the Duggars. It was all about IBLP. And that was the story that she really wanted to tell. Yes. Um, and of course, we know as, as it developed, they had to do some things to, to, so Amazon would pick it up. Oh, yeah. Essentially. Right. yeah. It makes so, sense commercially. People right. knew the Duggars, the Duggars were in the news, all of that stuff. And then and it, it, basically it's like, what was it episode three where they like pulled the curtain back and like, Oh, there's also all of this yeah, stuff. Yeah. Anyway, back to the Duggars and people are like, wait, why? <laughs> but what was that? Well, and, and that's why Bryce and I really decided to do the podcast series because after watching, you know, the documentary, it was kind of like, well, well, wait, you, you didn't really even cover the, the most insidious part of all of this. I mean, yeah, Josh Duggar was a monster, what? but behind the scenes, you had an army of monsters uh, that were yeah. encouraging and enabling that type of behavior, that type of predatory, abusive behavior. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, I, I, Lindsay, you you were actually part of the documentary. Um, as far as your, you know, just kind of your synopsis of it, can can you just give us your thoughts? Um, I totally feel you, like John Cornish just said, actually, that the, the intention was to pretty much just expose IBLP, ATI, and Bill Gothard. And as you know, when you're trying to pitch these things to the big boxes, you got to say, like, look, what can we do to bring in the biggest... Um, the biggest viewership. And quite frankly, I think it was the smartest thing that could have happened because yeah. if it had just been IBLP, Bill Gothard, you would have had yeah. all of us fringe people who in experienced it. We all would have watched it. But with Amazon, you know, really leaning into the Duggars, hundreds of thousands of millions of people have seen this documentary and it is reaching across different faiths, different platforms. It is amazing the amount of people that are reaching out that have had similar upbringings, even if they were not ATI and IBLP. Um, my entire experience, I've been um, involved with Olivia Christ from Chick Entertainment, um, our director. I've been involved with her for three years now working on this project. Um, this was not a fly by the seat of the pants. They, they pulled in other production companies as well. Story Force was also a big a part of this. And they they did the best that they could and made an actual collective narrative. I don't know if people really understood that, but through all of us speaking on the documentary, you understood, even my, my aunts and uncles who had never really understood what a IBLP and ATI were, they were calling me going, whoa, were you disciplined like this? Wait, we didn't realize you didn't have an education, but we knew you were homeschooled. So they did a very good job of helping everybody understand that this is probably something that almost everyone was experiencing in some sh way, shape or form in their lives. Yeah. And, and Lindsay, it's interesting because that's one of the most frequent uh, pieces of feedback that Bryce and I have gotten you know, doing the podcast is, you know, even folks that weren't part of IBLP, but, but were, you know, in that larger fundamental evangelical community, uh, it's just so relatable for them because mm -hmm. everyone experienced it to a degree if they were in that environment. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're, we're crossing platforms with Mormonism as well. I've been on several Mormon podcasts. It's, it's mind blowing really, because it's opening up and exposing so much to so many people. Yeah, I, uh, it's, it's interesting. I did a, a, a couple podcasts with a, a fundamental Mormon uh, mm -hmm. and realized that he grew up with a lot of the same rules, a lot of the same structure, 
a lot of the same doctrine. Uh, it just so happens that, uh, you know, if you're in his cult, uh, you get to have about as many wives as you want, uh, as long as you follow all the rules. <laughs> Which seems kind of unfair for us. <laughs> kind of like, whoa. <laughs> a whole piece of the Old Testament yeah, that yeah, they skipped crazy, right mate. over. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the other thing that Lindsay pointed out, how many people have been exposed to this documentary? As a lot of y'all know, I, I do stand-up comedy. Um, and I talk about the cult in my stand-up comedy set. Um, and every single show that I've done since the documentary came out, if I ask, hey, how many of y'all have seen it? There's always at least two or three in every crowd. And, and these are not, you know, fundamental Christian people or ex IBL peers showing up at these shows. These are just normal audiences. So yeah, it exposed, it exposed this cult, uh, to millions of people, I think. And, and, uh, hopefully it's establishing that, uh, this is not something that we want to repeat. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that I've, that I've heard a lot from people too, is that there is finally something and I know I've experienced this too, that after 40 years, I can, when someone asks me how I was raised, or I'm trying to explain it, I can actually say, go watch this thing. Yeah. And I don't have to try to explain because there's just no way to explain it, but it does the, an incredible job of boiling it down mm -hmm. in four episodes. And it, it was a real gift that, yeah. that Olivia and her team gave to us. Oh, absolutely agree. Uh, and when you tell your friends to go watch it, to understand your childhood, yeah. you always get the when they come back after watching it, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Uh, I had no idea. This explains a lot about yeah. you, about who you are as a person. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, our experiences at training centers. I know that there's a couple of folks in the audience who uh, have been through some of that. I believe uh, you grew up, uh, or maybe not grew up, but spent some time at the, the Russia Training Center, right? We've got some folks, uh, I think, in the back that probably visited. Bryce, you spent a ton of time uh, oh, at yes. training centers, working on staff. Oh, for I, the training I centers. very proud was, were my parents. You know, I was on staff, and, <laughs> and honestly, it was a of the groups that you could be working for in the institute. It was one that was like had a little prestige to it. You had a it cushy like, job. <laughs> yeah, it was all right. You know, it's all right. I was two doors down from my room at the Holiday Inn. You know, it was great. Um, and when I left, I had like I had the microwave and I had a mini fridge and I had a computer and people were always knocking on my door. Hey, Brandon, hey, can I and like, no, you can't. You don't mention anything about this. Well, and you also had the infamous Tabasco holster. Oh, my, my, uh, friend. my friend. I mean, just <laughs> making all you remember the, the kitchen. Yes. All right. Many, many six o'clock in the morning oh, pancake yeah. days down. And yeah. And then, and then the questionable, you know, quality and recipes of, oh, <laughs> been to the food bank, have we? <laughs> <laughs> I always joked you could take the oatmeal and caulk the windows. I mean, that stuff was. It was ba baked oatmeal. That was a thing. Oh, no. Look, I made baked oatmeal the other day. It is, it is very good. It's actually. That's the best thing I learned. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, Bryce, that's your trauma talking right now. <laughs> Um, you, you don't know, man. You don't know. <laughs> My sister backs me up on this. All right. All right. It, I mean, Bryce is a phenomenal cook. Uh, Lindsay, I, I wanted to hear a little bit about your training center experience because there wasn't a whole lot of it that was discussed during the documentary. And I know that uh, you were at headquarters. You were in Oklahoma, I believe. Did, did you just do kind of the tour of all the training centers or? <laughs> What was that? No. Um, what people don't realize is Oklahoma Training Center was actually a uh, disciplinary move for me. Um, I was at headquarters for two and a half years, and I was pulled up there by Bill Gothard. He met me at the seminar in Atlanta and pulled me up there. I did make a pit stop at the Indianapolis Training Center to take the ca counseling seminar because, God mm. forbid, I go up to headquarters and not at least have that in my you know backpack of skill sets uh, <laughs> at 18 years old. And I get up there and I start working in the ATI department. So I actually use those two weeks of counseling skills because now I'm counseling sad, upset, uh, disgruntled mothers, uh, trying to help them as an 18 year old to, I don't know, deal with their kids and teach the wisdom booklets and keep up on their reporting. I mean, I was way in over my head, but wow. I'm a shiny, happy person. So of course I, they wouldn't know any different that I didn't know what I was doing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was there during those first six months that I was there, Bill Gothard, my experience with him was just uh, consistent prayer times that we'll, we'll talk about later when we connect with Bill Gothard. But, um, I, <laughs> I got in trouble because I kissed a boy. And, oh. um, yeah. Hey, you and, I and, like wow. you and Mr. Gothard have that in common. Was ah, stop like, it. He had never kissed a boy either up until that moment. You know. wow, okay, Bill was, was not the guy that I kissed. <laughs> 
Um, but this guy that I uh, ends up being my husband, first of all, his name is Bryce. So it's really weird right now that Brandon goes by Bryce. I'm just saying. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> so anyway, um, but I kissed him and through the, the weirdest, most bizarre events the, it, at the time you have to call like, oh my gosh, that must be God. He caught me because someone overheard us having a conversation on a telephone by, by way of their phone in a completely different building. Don't oh, I this day I will never, my husband and I are like, how? Um, I think he had listening devices in my husband's <laughs> room. But anyway, he overheard us talking. We were like, this was a great kiss, but we cannot do this again. Like, this is this is off limits here. We are going to get screwed if we do this again. Like, headquarters, it's, it's very literally obvious. Screwed. Yeah, that's the best whole problem. We know kiss. what kissing leads to. <laughs> I it is very like, obvious that Lindsay married a bad boy. That much is true. <laughs> But I, I, the moment I had this kiss, I was like, oh, I understand why my parents did not want me to do this. This is, <laughs> is going to go bad real fast <laughs> in all the best ways. But this this guy at two in the morning uh, knocked on my husband. Well, I, he's my husband, so that's why I call him. But knocked on his door and said, hey, um, I overheard you and Lindsay talking. And if you don't tell Bill Gothard in the morning, I'm going to tell him. And so he called me back and he's like, uh, we're in big trouble. We've got to, we've got to out ourselves. And I was like, oh, okay, here we go. So he went and talked to Bill Gothard. I talked to, uh, Mr. Bell, the guy that was in charge of like student HR. And, um, yeah, within two days, uh, Bryce was sent home with his brother. They worked in the computer department as programmers. So that was a really good strategic move on IBLP's part to, uh, move, you know, good working people. And then I'm just like, you know, the little, I don't know, rainbow bright over here. Uh, let's just, let's send the, uh, the Barbie doll home. So, uh, I stay, I stay for three more months and I thought, wow, I've, I've, you know, whew, I'm not leaving. And, uh, Bill sits me down one day and he's like, well, Lindsay, um, unfortunately I can't keep the board at bay any longer. And I'm like the board at bay for what, what, why, what is the board involved in, in any, to any capacity right now? And he was like, so I'm going to have to send you to the Oklahoma city training center. And, you know, you can work there and, you know, maybe at some point the Lord will work in your heart and wow. lead you somewhere else. And I was like, well, maybe we should talk to my parents. Cause maybe I should just go home. He's like, well, I've already <laughs> talked to your dad and he approves. So tomorrow or next week, you're going to be sent down to the Oklahoma city training center. So I had one week wow. pack up my stuff, literally went down with like the law program, 15 past bus was dropped off there and left there. So yeah, Unreal. five months at the Oklahoma City Training Center, and it was absolute hell on earth. Sorry, Brandon. I know you love <laughs> the OTC. <laughs> I know you don't love it, but I'm just saying, like, it was it was hell for me. And his sister I, was my roommate. I remember. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I remember talking to you when you got there, and I was like, she seems angry in my head. I was like, she's, there's some tension. I let you borrow some of my Southern Gospel CDs. You returned them, and you mocked me. <laughs> You're like, this is not music. These guys can't sing. This is garbage. I was like, okay. It sounds like me. I think we were uh, we were on the tail end of our time there. I feel like, or getting close, because you know, we were not the people you wanted to uh, to put other disenfranchised people with. We were like, what's up? What's going on? No, I'm not going to the evening session. Absolutely not. I'm going to read the Tom Clancy book for the eighth time. <laughs> Oh what gosh. was your, uh, Lindsay, what was your impression of the, uh, the Indianapolis training center? Terrifying. Yeah. Um, I, I, we would go down there from headquarters for the, like, uh, um, sorry for the Christmas conferences, um, okay. during the holidays. And then because of Bill's attachment to me, I would get dragged down there a lot for like maybe three or four days. Um, it's just like, again, just some really weird girl that's just hanging out waiting to be of purpose somewhere but yeah. also like this huge like label on myself like gothard girl so it's kind of like no one wants to talk to you but everybody knows maybe they should but then i don't belong anywhere so i'm either working in the kitchen for like a hot second but then they don't want me in there or i'm like helping organize something for a seminar but then they, they scoop me out and it's just like it's very strange. You have nowhere that you belong, but then you're like the pet to Bill. And I'm telling you, my, the whole thing was really creepy. But the Indianapolis Training Center really had no escape. Like it, it felt like the bog of hell. There, there was no way to get out. My brother was there for a couple of weeks and he was telling me that he was outside in the parking lot doing some lawn stuff. And there were like gunshots fired through the parking lot and oh, everybody yeah. like dropped to the ground. And I'm like, what? I never <laughs> had heard that before. Yeah. We found slugs um, in the parking lot a couple of times oh uh, while I was out there. Yeah. Just it very a, oppressive. A very, a very oppressive place. space. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, John, what about you? What, what <laughs> training centers were you in? So I spent, I think, a total of 10 weeks in Indianapolis. Um, really? Yeah. So I did, did the counseling seminar, you know, at age 15. That's the thing you have to do because all 15-year-olds, you know, how to counsel and solve all the world's yeah. problems, like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like Lindsay said. Um, and honestly, counseling seminars were some of the craziest of the craziest ideas were thrown out. In fact, I, the, the one that I remember the most is Bill told us that, that blue jeans were not should not be worn because the world wears blue jeans and therefore, uh. you know, Ergo, we should not wear blue jeans because we're not like the world. So I didn't wear blue jeans for four years. I have repented of that, as you can see tonight. <laughs> um, I remember that from the counseling seminar, and I spent a total. I did Sound Foundations, which was their basic music program, and then mm-hmm. six weeks of their advanced music program. So being in the music program, we were a little bit sheltered from some of the worst of the crazy because we were kind of a program. It's almost like we were just kind of passing through renting space on the 13th floor. Yeah. Um, but we were able to observe, you know, the, the life focus and the equip. Focus. Oh, you saw the life focus guys. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's quite possible we were overlapped. I, um, so I oh, yeah. what, what 2001, was I was there during when the world Trade center fell. Okay. Yeah. No. So <laughs> I was, uh, I was there, I believe in 1999. Okay. So a couple uh, years when, before. yeah, because I spent the only exposure that I had to the training centers, uh, was Indianapolis. Yeah. The, the worst of the worst as, as Lindsay fondly refers to it. Uh, and uh, I was there for the Life Focus program, and, yeah. and that was really the program for problem kids, for, for bad kids. Yeah, yeah. it was. I, I was uh, a cult bad boy. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's like being I was a- the good boy. <laughs> Rules was, have changed. I was the I was the invisible boy. <laughs> the invisible boy. Nice. I just followed the rules. You were the lost everything. boy. Nice. You were the musician. You didn't need I, sound uh, foundations. I always say that being a cult bad boy is like being the coolest Christian rocker. So really not cool at all. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that uh, that's the program that I was there for. So it's yeah. it's interesting hearing everyone's different experiences with the compounds because they are all so incredibly different. Mm -hmm. Um, The contrast between my experience and Bryce's experience is wild because you had a relatively positive experience, um, you know, aside from the stuff you just didn't know any better on. I was was pre-broken and they could not break you. That was the big difference. So I I think there was a difference too, just in the, 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 the personality of the leadership Right, in oh, Indianapolis massive. and Oklahoma City. So it was two different types of abuse. I think Indianapolis was more rules and control and uh-huh. just you know constant surveillance. Right. Oklahoma City was more this insidious hyper spiritualism. Yeah. Mm. Um, fun, fun was a bit of a sin. So, but we do need some exercise. So we're gonna walk around in a circle in the parking lot like cattle. Yeah. Well, what, <laughs> what, I, what I remember is after the, chores. What I yeah. <laughs> What I remember is the exhaustion because they would get us. The guys were up at was it five thirty or six? It was that wasn't early. mandatory, was it not? Well, it was mandatory if you wanted to be on the good side of the leadership. Well, so. I was already on staff, so, <laughs> so I, okay. I tried that a few times. But up at six, you know, work all day, make breakfast once a week, do dishes in the afternoon, walk around the parking lot like hamsters for an hour, then go to an evening session, which is the basic seminar for the two hundredth time, and then maybe go to bed and then do it all over again. So the fun. only I, I remember like like the the hymn scenes were the most the thing I looked forward to the most. Yeah, when the, the blind pianist came in and we yeah I made him I picked every southern gospel song out of the hymn book really like, play this it's got a little groove to <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I don't know so I know Bryce you were never in a prayer room. Uh, John, were you ever in a prayer room? I was never in a prayer room. So okay. like, yeah, that was oh, okay. winner winner. Oh, we've oh we've got a prayer roomer in the audience. All Ooh. right, two weeks, two weeks in a prayer. Uh, Lindsay, were you ever in a prayer room? Hell no. I was sent to Oklahoma for five months. No, okay, yeah. <laughs> it was just a much larger prayer room. It's a bigger you were prayer in. building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's, uh, what's crazy about the prayer room too is that on on. Gothard's Facebook page, even like two weeks ago, he was denying that they even existed. That there was Which, there was there was no prayer room. They've, I'm like, they've always all... done that though. They, yeah. They've always done that because there was an incident, I believe, in Arkansas, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, uh, or no, I'm sorry, it was in Colorado, and there was a a violent incident. I I don't want to say it because YouTube, uh, but yeah, there was a violent incident, and it was uh, a young man that claimed that the reason he did what he did uh, is because he'd been locked in a prayer room, um, and everyone at the training centers denied it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I was in there for one week. Uh, so you got me beat by a week. But uh, was it the same for you where it was just a bare room with a bed and a Bible? Yep, that's that's what we had. I was I was in there for a week. You were in there for two. And it's, it's interesting because 
it's it's hard to convey how traumatizing that truly is. Uh, you know, because really you're just hanging out by yourself. Uh, but I think after the first probably two days is when like the psychosis started setting in for me and they would only feed you once a day. And that was the only human interaction you got. You weren't allowed out of your room. So there wasn't, you know, an hour of exercise like they give you in prison, actual prison. Uh, no, you were just in there until they decided you were done. Uh, and I think that that for me was uh, indicative of kind of what you were talking about, John, with the the rules uh, that were so uh, I, I mean, they, they, they were just uh, they were hyper focused on rule following uh, in Indianapolis. Yeah. And focused on breaking your breaking your spirit. I mean, we heard that analogy a lot in IBLP, yeah. this idea of like training animals. You right. know, it's like that's kind of how they viewed us. We were we were to be broken in our spirit. Uh -huh. And, you know, and that's how they did it. Yep. Know, so Absolutely. Um, talking about uh, the training centers. Now we have to talk about Bill Gothard, of course. Uh, Bryce, you only really had that one encounter uh, with Mr. Gothard, of course. <laughs> Wait, let's show some respect. I, I don't re really remember it. I'm 90% sure I said, can I get this picture with you for my mother? And, and <laughs> yeah, and I was because I was like, I don't want to come under this guy's gaze at all. You yeah. Know? I, I, and I really only had a very brief encounter uh, with Gothard. It was a one-on-one a -on -one session that I had with him after I got out of the prayer room. Uh, because I'd been accused of defrauding some of the young ladies at the uh, Indianapolis Training Center. Uh, and so he needed to have a very in-depth graphic conversation with me about that. Um, John, I know you've talked to him pretty extensively outside of <laughs> yes. the cult, right? Yeah, I think I met him once at at the counseling seminar, but it was just that group photo thing. I still have that photo. Yeah. Um, and then um, there was one time he came through Oklahoma city. Actually, my family was there and a few other families and we all got to meet with him. And, and, and the thing that he it was funny, I remember what he said, cause he walked in this room and there was four families, but it just happened. And you'll know how rare this is. There were four families, each who had like two to three kids max, which is very unusual for IBLP. It's almost a sin. Yeah. Yeah. And he, well, and he walks in the room and he, he, he walks in and he looks around he goes, where are the children? Oof, it's kind of crazy. And the ones between 11 and 16. <laughs> and, 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 and I know for like for my mom in particular, that was a really hard, harsh thing to say because she had wanted to have more children. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for him, it was just a thing. So I, I, I met him that time. And then, um, yeah, then I didn't meet him again until I was in my 30s and recovering grace had uh -huh. started. And, and he was. It's a, it's a long story of how he tried to contact us multiple times, but I ended up being kind of a phone partner for him off and on for a couple of years. And yeah, so you've had multiple conversations with him. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get in, <laughs> yeah, a little pen pal. Uh, and we're gonna get into a lot of that yeah. when we talk about recovering grace specifically. Yeah. Lindsay, I think you probably had the most interaction with Bill Gothard, uh, and, and I just kind of I'd love to hear about your experience uh, and 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 what happened there between between you and him. Yeah, um, it was too much interaction, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, from the very get go, when he saw me in Atlanta, he found he saw me in the breakfast room. All of the kids were getting ready to do the Children's Institute, and we didn't even know he was staying at the same hotel. So he walks into the breakfast room, and every all the students are like, "Oh, it's Mr. Gothard!" You know, we're meeting our powerful man. And um, he went about his business, got his food, went and sat a few tables away from me, and just locked eyes. And I was like, wow, that's really weird. That, that, that's weird. I don't, you know, I kept eating and I kept kind of turning to my brother and talking to him. And then I'd look back and he's still just staring my direction. And I started feeling a little panicky. Like, I don't know what he's doing. Maybe he sees God in me. Maybe I'm just illuminated with the Lord. And uh, he walks right over to me in the middle of this room with all these other students. And he's like, what is your name? And I'm like, Lindsay. And he was like, well, come and see me in my office tonight. And I was like, okay. And uh, he was like, just come to the front of the, the seminar, you know, the stage when, when we're done, just come to the front, my assistant will get you and you know, you'll come over to my offices. And I'm like, okay, you know, you, you just, you blindly trust him. Mm -hmm. So I did, I came down to the stage, his assistant got me and off we went into the van, the infamous maroon van. I was all pimped out, Bill Gothard-like. And uh, he was just 
beaming at me the whole ride over. And I I just couldn't understand it. But I was, you know, kind of like proud of myself because like, well, my parents are never going to believe this. This is great. You know, this is what your parents live for is for you to have these connections with Bill Gothard. And now I just magically have one. But I get over there and, you know, he he pushes me off to the kitchen and I'm helping all the ladies. And then we eat dinner and I go into his office and he starts his rigmarole that I now know he's done with so many other girls where he starts asking, what's your age? What's your spiritual gift? How many kids are in the family? How long have you been ATI, IBLP, blah, blah, blah. How many seminars? And then he's like, and um, are you courting anybody? I was like, well, there's a 35 year old guy back home who's been wanting to court me since I was 17. And he's still entertaining himself with my dad. And he's like, well, you need to release him immediately. And I was like, from what? Like, I'm, I'm not doing anything right now. And he's like, well, you need to call him and release his heart. I'm like, I didn't haven't done anything. <laughs> and so then he's like, yeah. And he's like, well, my next question is, are you a virgin? And I was like, wow. whoa, whoa. And his assistant is in the corner. Again, I'm, I've been raised since I was eight in this. So this type, even the word I was so appalled by, and I'm sure when he just sees the girl's reactions, he can tell I've made them uncomfortable. You know, I kind of was like, didn't really know what to say after that. And he's like, okay, well, come back tomorrow night. And that was it. And so every night that week, after every single session, I would come up and we would rinse and repeat. And I would go sit in his office. Um, At the end of the week, he called my parents. I'd love for Lindsay to come to headquarters. And they're like, we would love that. We're so honored. And off I went. Yeah, I just went right back, right up to headquarters. And I was there for almost three years. And um, the first six months that I was there, he, I had a very tumultuous home and um, a lot of things were going on back, back there. And so I was actually kind of happy to be away, even though I was in another environment that was very strict and rigid, but he took advantage of my home story and decided that we needed to pray mm. constantly. And the, the prayers were like, he would make sure that his assistant would leave and then I, he would take me over to his, I call it the prayer couch and everything's red and red velvet. And I, we, I thought we were going to sit down the very first time. So I go to sit down. He's like, no, 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 we're going to kneel and supplicate before the Lord. And I was like, oh, okay. Wow. I guess that's how, how he does it. So we get down on the, on our knees and he's, he's, he's like slunk very close to me. And I was like, uh, six inch rule, sir. You know, but he just, he was not, he was not far enough away. And so I just, you know, put my hands together. I'm a little nervous. I don't know what's happening. And um, I close my eyes and all of a sudden I feel his hand grab my hand and he pulls it away and he interlocks it with his. And he starts massaging my hand with his thumb. And then it becomes, if, if this is too much, please tell me, but he, no, no, he no, pushes he pushes his arm up against me and then his shoulder. And, and then it just progresses his hip and his thigh, his knee, his leg. And then his, his shoed foot is just like trying to rub on mine, like a clubbed leg, you know, just like, duh, 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 duh. and I was just like, what? I was so sensory overloaded. I couldn't hear him praying. I didn't know what was going on, but I also was not trained to be able to stand up and say, I'm sorry, excuse me. What are you doing? I'm going to leave mm-hmm. now. This mm-hmm. is inappropriate. So you just kind of freeze. And um, all of a sudden he nudges and snuggles his head into mine and he whispers, now it's your turn. And I was like, my turn to what? Like, am I reciprocating this and like pushing myself back into him? And I realized, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. Pray, just pray. So I don't know what I said. I just tried to say it as fast as I could and then said, amen. And uh, very quickly released myself from this situation. I stood up, I got my bag and I'm like, well, Lord bless. Thank you. Bye. And um, mm. that was rinse and repeat for at least six months, three to four times a wow. week. Wow. And three I, to four times a week, you were enduring. Times, yes, uh, same thing. The exact same thing. I would. We had to go up to staff center for our lunches, and I was so naive. And I, I had not learned yet to be saucy and to be a little manipulative. And so I was just kind of going with it. You know, like I would go up to lunch, and he'd come and find me. Well, Lindsay, come and pray tonight. And I'm like, oh. And I just think the avoidance from him wanting to avoid him started to kind of like percolate the manipulation. And so I would start avoiding lunches and I would um, maybe not show up on time and just start to try to push away a little bit. And quite frankly, he stopped doing it as much with me because I started understanding that he was doing it with other girls. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't know that at the time, but mm-hmm. it progressively got stranger because I had medical issues at headquarters. Again, every time I would have an issue, he would take it upon himself to shrink more to me and want to have a grasp on me. And at one point he actually moved me to Brook Manor, which is right across from his office. And he could see my bedroom from his office and he could see when I was there. 
So I would yeah. never turn my light on and I moved my desk to the other side of the room so he couldn't see the, my computer light illuminating into the room so that I, I would just, you know, <laughs> type and stuff in the dark with a, like a towel over my computer so he wouldn't know that I was there and then wow. not call me and want me to come across the street. Yeah. I, I have a question. Um, do you think that you got sent away because you had kissed a boy and now you're less he's less interested or because he was he had acquired new women that he was interested in i mean he had been acquiring girls for many years you know, there were there were so many i honestly think because of the way he said it to me that the board was pressuring him i think they were just like we need this girl to go partially simply because of him, because of his actions. They're like, get her out of here. Plus, I was aware later that two other guys got sent home because of me, and I did not know that. Um, really? Yeah, a guy, I think within the first three months, I swear I'm not a bad person. Within the, fir <laughs> within the first three months of being there, a guy came up to him, it came to Bill and professed, like, I would like to in the consider entering into courtship with Lindsay. Um, I'm going to reach out to her parents. And Bill was like, she's not ready. Go home. And he sent him home. And I, I didn't know that for like two years. And when I found out, I was like, so I felt so bad for the guy because that, I mean, that's not his fault. That's what he's taught to do. You yeah. know, it wasn't my fault either. I just happened to be there. Uh, I mean, to be fair, not to be fair, but like when I went to the uh, counseling seminar, the young men's counseling seminar, and I don't know how it was for the women, but um, inevitably at some point during that, two or three it would start with a couple and then everybody would get up and start confessing in front of like mm -hmm. thousands of, i had impure <laughs> thoughts i was in the elevator and a girl got on and just confessing it in front of you know thousands i'm i just remember sitting in the front row going like i would <laughs> even if i did those things there's absolutely no way i'm gonna you guys yeah. are crazy <laughs> yeah it was it was they they would it was the environment to, to a degree for sure absolutely and and, yeah. and Lindsay, you know as as that relationship progressed because I, I think it was a, a really interesting question from bryce as, as that relationship with with gothard progressed did it did it seem like there was frustration with you kind of rejecting his advances or or not wanting to spend more time with him or not really not feeding into his manipulation i have wondered for years why mm. he didn't go further because I would always come to his call. You know, I would, I would heed the call and come and go through the motions of praying. And it never changed outside of that. It like the location never changed. His movements never changed. Um, he also was a massive footsie guy, which we all know, but with me, oh my God, like the level of secondhand embarrassment and horror that someone would see him doing it with me, what just made me so petrified. He would do it during delegations. I was always pulled up to the front table to have like the Russian delegations and the Chinese delegations and Taiwanese, like everybody would come in and he's like, well, Lindsay, come to the front table. And I tried to move a chair or two down. Didn't matter. He had telescopic legs. He would find <laughs> my feet and I would like hook around the back of the chairs. So I'm like, it's as far away as it possibly can go. And he would still, it was like, Bloop, and he'd just start rubbing my foot. And I'm like, oh my God, what's wrong with you? And then in the vans, when we would go down to Indianapolis, you know, same thing. He would invite me to take my shoes off and then it would be sock and pantyhose. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so gross, but I don't, so I, to this day, I don't really know, but one of the theories that some of us girls have is that he had different types of girls for different types of kinks. And I just filled hmm. a space of being pliable and reliable to a certain thing that he could do. It could yeah. be very wrong and off, but it's it's strange that, you know, my other friends that have experienced these things, the way that he would approach them and it would be kind of an assistant, type, uh, a consistent type of approach with them as well. So interesting uh, yeah I, I don't really have full answers on that huh weird. and you know the thing that you mentioned about him grooming uh multiple women or girls at, at a time I, I mean we know that for a fact uh with so many of of the folks that i've talked to uh there's a lady named rachel i don't know if you've had any conversations yeah. with with her Lindsay. you know who i'm talking about yep um yeah. where you know this was this was a woman uh her story is on recovering grace yeah uh, and this is someone that that Bill Gothard professed love for and supposedly asked the board's permission to marry. Um, now, that's what he told her. Who knows if that that's actually true or if he was just manipulating and stringing her along the entire time as well. 
Uh, we, we have no way of knowing that. Uh, but we do know that he had a, I, I mean, a, a harem of women, uh, for lack of a better term. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things. I know we'll talk more about Recovering Grace and how that all came about. But, you know, the reality is this pattern that, that, that Lindsay's talking about, it, mm -hmm. it, it started in the 70s. Yeah. And it, it continued up to the to recent years. Um, I, th I think for me, one of the things, one of the most eye-opening conversations I had, um, some of you might know the name, some of our listeners online too might know the name Gary Smalley. Um, Gary Smalley was a, uh, was well known kind of in evangelical circles outside of fundamentalism as a kind of a marriage family guru. People don't know that he got to start working for IBLP back mm. in, in the seventies. Um, so when some of this stuff was first coming out, um, I, I got to have a conversation, a couple of conversations with him. Um, and um, one of the things that he told me, um, cause he, he left in the, in the eighties when the first scandal happened. So I'll, I'll we don't have time to go into all that. But one of the things he told me was that that Bill and his father had hiring practices where with young women, they always always asked two questions. They 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 looked for girls who had daddy issues, mm -hmm. problems at home, and they looked for girls who had sexual experience. Mm. And he said that was just that was just the facts of the situation. So hearing someone from this who worked for him in the 70s, very closely worked with them in the 70s, just confirm that was the moment for me when I was like, holy crap, this this is a lifelong pattern. Yeah, these aren't isolated events no. by any stretch of the imagination. And it was and it was strategic and it was intentional. Yeah. Mm. That's it, it's just crazy. The guy's a monster. Uh he's a predatory monster. Uh and and we've we've all experienced that to some degree or another. Uh the crazy part to me is that there's still people who defend him. Yep. Um and that is some of the feedback that I've gotten from from guys who went through the alert program even uh just folks online his his handlers online of course. <laughs> uh still defend him to the hilt yeah. um but they, they can say anything they want the fact of the matter is there was a scandal that rocked the iblp cult uh crippled it and forced gothard to to leave in disgrace and that's that's actually what i want to get into now yeah uh if you could john sure well so yeah the, this whole scandal thing it's, it's funny when we look back you know recovering grace started in 2011 um and when we when we started and there was a team of 20 30 of us at the time who kind of um brainstormed this idea of a website and we really didn't have a good idea of what was going on especially hadn't identified this this pattern um i think most of us that that grew up in ati iblp at least heard kind of the rumors of of at least the bill had his favorites you know he, we knew he liked the blonde girls and that was kind of just the thing but it was kind of this kind of kind of this thing that's just kind of that little weird thing he does but nothing yeah. wrong you know he could never do anything wrong you know it's you know it's god the father son holy spirit and bill gothard so there, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, there's just no way it could be sinful because he's doing it that, that's the logic right there um but when we started recovering grace the, the goal we never set out to be a whistleblowing site or to to even take Gother down. We wanted to be a, a resource, a haven, a home for people who had grown up like we did to process the trauma and to share stories, to find healing, to move on and find ways to do it. And honestly, we were all trying to figure out how that happens ourselves. We were all in the process of healing. Um, and so we're just we were just trying to be kind of a place to, to share. Well, I think it was about one or two years into the website, um, we received our first submission of someone sharing a story. I mean, what's crazy about these stories, you could read one, you've read them all, and, it's, yeah. it's, and, and these people don't know each other. Some mm -hmm. of them do now, but at the time, these people didn't know each other. It was like, it was like that, that happened, and then this happened, and, and so we're, we're going, okay, what do we do with this information? First of all, if we, if we publish it, is he going to, you know, is this million do multi-million dollar corporation going to sue us and yeah. you know, try to destroy our lives. So we were, we were terrified with what to do with the information. Um, and we were trying to corroborate pieces as best we could. Thankfully, there were a few, um, even some, some training center staff leaders who we were able to, to reconnect with, connect with. And, 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 and that's what was so insidious about this is no one, or I say no one, very few people ever actually saw these instances because mm. they were so well planned and late at night prayer times, mm -hmm. you know, but we were able to, to verify that 
that the circumstances were plausible that, that yeah. these people worked there. They were a, f- a favorite of his. There were times that he was alone with them. So we knew, we, we knew enough. Um, so it was, I think it was 2012 that we published kind of the, the first story. And from there it was kind of the, the avalanche of, yeah. they just came in and came in. So, well, and, and that was one of the, the interesting things to observe. Um, and, and I can't remember who, who said it, Lindsay, you, you actually might've mentioned it. Uh, but when, when one accuser comes forward um, and other people realize, oh, wait, he was doing that to to more than just me. uh, It gives them the courage to come forward as well and share their story. Uh, And that's really what happened with Recovering Grace. I I mean, it really was this domino effect where y'all were receiving stories from all over the world uh, from dozens of people that were sharing the exact same experience. Right. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, we we had we we were even developing a a, t- a chronology of like, okay, this, this person was here, then this person was here, and then just watching how it expanded, hearing from some of the, some of the stories on recovering grace. Some of you that have followed it closely, there's some from the '70s, you know, um, and it's like you have this whole timeline of these stories that are that are nearly identical. Mm. The, the, the 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 plans and the strategy and the techniques and the methods and yeah and yeah. Uh, Lindsay, what was what was your first exposure to recovering grace? It was it was pretty early on. I would say 2011, 2012. And I remember reading the very early stories. Um, I I actually saw part of my own story in someone's story and I knew who it was. And I was like, wait a minute, what is she do- what is she doing? And I realized that she was a part of the Recovering Grace team. And um, it was really interesting because the, the part of the story was him glorifying how skinny I had become because I was in the hospital for a blood clot and I was in there for a week. And wow. I got really skinny. I had all these blood draws. I was on blood thinners. And he just could not stop praising me in front of people. And during that time, he also asked my physician, who was one of his doctors, he called up that physician. I had to go every week to get blood draws. And he called him and said, hey, um, reach out to her or let her know that if she needs any this like specific procedure, I'll cover it. So then I go into the office and the doctor's like, so Bill was saying, if you want your mole removed on my face, um, he, I, I can do that for you and he'll cover it. Huh. And I was like, what, what? Like he talks about self-acceptance. What, what in the hell is going on? And so I, I literally said to him, I'm like, Bill teaches self-acceptance and I have accepted the way that God made me. So thank you for the offer, but I'm good. Like, is it cancerous? If it's cancerous, then yes, please take it off. But he was like, no, you're, you're fine. It looks, it's, it's fine. And so the next time I had to see Bill, I literally was like, um, hi, Bill, like just like covering my face for a second. And he was like, oh, I see you didn't get that removed. And I was like, um, I'm just, I just, you teach self-acceptance. And he's like, well, it would brighten your countenance. Oh my wow. God. So, yeah. So wow. seeing, seeing that, the yeah. parts of those, my own stories on recovering grace, I was just like, wow, this is, this is becoming big. And like you said, I could see my stories in theirs, especially the footsieing and the praying and getting girls, secluding girls away from other people so that you didn't, I, his insidiousness and his calculation of being able to like corral us away from people so that it looked like he was doing something pure. And then he clearly had, you know, cruel intentions about it. Um, so yeah, that was my, but I loved recovering grace. I was obsessed with it. Still am. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's, it was enlightening for a lot of us, and I, I think it was actually Bryce that that introduced me to recovering grace because I was super focused on on uh, my substance abuse and alcoholism at that point. Um, and so Bryce introduced me to it, and I saw a life focus story on there, mm-hmm. um, and it was just like, oh wow, I wasn't the only one. Like I wasn't just the bad kid that didn't graduate from life focus <laughs> because I was so evil and sinful. There were other people that went through this too. Uh, oh, by the way. I wanted to mention, Lindsay, uh, just so you, I know you can't see the audience right now, uh, but someone flipped off Gothard for you in solidarity <laughs> from the audience. Thank I you. Just to, I just to point that out. Yeah, with the mole discussion. And if anybody has his address, I'm going to get a vintage Cindy Crawford poster and just mail it to him. <laughs> I'll get it for you. I drove by his house when I was there in October, so nice. I got it for you. Yeah, yeah. hook you up. So, so, Bryce, you introduced me to, to Recovering Grace. I mean, what, what was... What was your feeling when you first started reading about this stuff? Shock. Yeah. Just absolute shock. Like yeah. we my sister and I went through you know our own little personal bubble and Oklahoma City was very very different 
And there was absolutely, to our knowledge, zero weird sexual abuse going on in Oklahoma City. I mean, nothing. And that was the environment. And we had heard like, oh, he, oh, he's got those girls with the curly hairs with him all the time. And that's that's it. That's all we really heard is like, he seems to have a lot of secretaries. And then I read the thing on, on the website and I'm just like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> what? It was just mind blowing. But, you know, my, my mother was like, well, if it was so bad, why didn't you say anything? It's like, we were in the will of God. Yeah. You guys were super proud. Yep. Nobody is going to fess up that this is weird and I'm uncomfortable. It's like, well, if I'm uncomfortable, then I'm not under the umbrella, right? Mm-hmm. It's just, it was, it was shocking. I actually don't remember even showing you. Uh, I, I, you may have sent me a link to it, actually. That, that may have been what it was. Uh, but th- that piece that you just mentioned right there, why wasn't anyone saying anything? That, that's the question. That's the feedback that, that we automatically get, right? Well, why didn't you say anything when it was happening? And, and it's exactly what Bryce mentioned. And, and John, you've talked about it, too. This, this, um, this cult really uh, created an environment where you had to subjugate yourself to this manipulation and predatory behavior. Uh, it was crazy. Well, if you if you look at the things that have happened since then, we now know that even if you had said something, they would have got the elders together, uh-huh. and then the guy could have just confessed in front of the church, and then they would have prayed, and then he would have just gone right back into his leadership position and continued. So it really would not have mattered. It needed the internet. Yeah, it, it really did. It had to go viral, and and that's exactly what happened with Recovering Grace. I mean, John, t- 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 tell me how much traffic – at the height of recovering great. I mean, your servers crashed uh, a couple times, right? I, I, once or twice early on, we got some, some big spikes. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the two biggest spikes we've had were, were, were when Josh Duggar's story broke out. Uh-huh. And then also in the last three months, it's, it's spiked yeah. again. We mm-hmm. had to batten down the hatches online to like keep, you know, keep the site, you know, working well, but yeah, no, it went, it, it was actually getting pretty good traffic before the, the scandal stuff started breaking, especially within the, the circles of, of survivors. But, um, it started getting some major public traffic, you know, in, in 2014, 2015. Yeah. And y'all have some, some really cool stuff planned for the future of recovering guys. I've no, I, I know I've had a couple conversations yeah. with you about that. Can you, can you share anything that, that y'all are working on right now? Yeah. It's, it's, it's been interesting because if, if people who, I'm sure everybody here stalks the website every single day, but, um, um, but you know, once, once the scandal, once got there was kind of gone and things calmed down a little bit, you know, the, the team kind of looked at each other and we're, we're like, what do we, what do we do now? We're exhausted. We've been, we've been publishing crazy for five years, lots of stress with all the stuff going on. Um, so we kind of just pressed pause and kind of just took a break and it ended up being like a five, six year break. Um, you know, the site's still up. We still kind of maintain it and some social media things, but this documentary has, has kind of rocked our world as, as, as it has, you know, so, uh-huh. so many of us, um, I, I guess, I think there are probably two or two or three thing realizations as a team, uh, we have had since the, the documentary came out. And I, the, first and foremost, we realized just how much healing we still have to do, mm-hmm. you know, um, as we're entering now our forties and our, our fifties, some, some of our team and, and just the, 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 I don't I hate to overuse the word trigger, but the triggering seeing the footage and mm-hmm. being reminded of all the teachings, things we had forgotten. It just mm-hmm. dragged up so many emotions. So we realized they're still healing for, for our generation to do. Right. Um, we realize now there's a whole new generation that's kind of waking up, not just even people who are from IBLP and ATI, but people who are adjacent, right. Um, who are exposed or who, I mean, we could get, we could talk for hours, about how the teachings of Gothard have, 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 have uh, well, when they're way in, snuck their way into the broader church. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and, Plus, you know, one of, one of our, our things from the beginning has been healing. And so we're trying to find a way to, to be a resource for, um, um, for churches, for, for uh, trauma-informed therapists who mm-hmm. want to learn how to help people who are coming out of this cult um, do so in a healthy manner. So we we kind of gotten the band back together um, behind the scenes and we're yeah. kind of brainstorming, okay, what does it look like? Technology and social media has changed a little bit in, in 10 years, so we're um, we're kick, we're working on a, a podcast that's going to launch probably in a month or two. Awesome, so, awesome, yeah, have a, have, very cool. Um, 
be on the lookout for the recovering grace podcast um coming yes. soon and uh um we're looking to have you know um trauma experts on there um survivors sharing their story just kind of navigating wh- how, what do you do as an adult coming out of, out of this cult how do we navigate there's we, we we kind of brainstormed a list of topics over one weekend and it's about probably 10 or 15 pages long at this point so oh, awesome. so look for that and and we're just kind of just kind of brainstorming seeing what, what might be next um but we we feel like there is more work to be done um and we owe a lot of that to the, the documentary so oh, fantastic and you put That's... a bid in on the oklahoma city training center is that correct <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> my, my favorite thing is the fact that and whenever any of us worked on staff it, it's like an administrative role in this massive organization so everybody at recovery grace is like highly trained administration to run a foundation it's it's like they're ready to go for out of the bat yeah it's it's interesting how the recovering grace team and, and you know so many of them are anonymous and people you know there, there are a few of us that have kind of been the public face over the years but there's a whole team of people who have dedicated hours it's like you yeah. know in, in, in our heyday it was like a second job it was we'd work our real jobs all day come home and write and edit and talk to bill and and it was just this crazy kind of craziness going on and they're used to working for free i mean that's just that's how we were raised <laughs> that's right that's right i don't know if y'all as uh, y'all in the live studio audience know that you know well, there, there's still a lot of work to be done at uh, the bunker on brazos here and we've actually got tools for everyone and after this is done Look under we're gonna seat. all volunteer together for spiritual growth it's, it's, it's uh, not volunteer it's an apprenticeship opportunity oh per- yes. thank you con yes, yes. branded perfectly yes. You, you, you're all apprentices life skills now. life skills <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a- after recovering grace kind of you know blew the lid off of gothard and, and iblp there was a series of lawsuits um as we know um unfortunately uh, L- Lindsay, were were you a part of uh that lawsuit as well i was asked to be a part of it and i had just moved to new york for my career and i quite frankly was terrified mm-hmm. i had been out of iblp for or ati and all of that for over 10 years at this point and i barely had a foundation of my own autonomy at that point. And I just felt like if I even heard his voice for one second, mm. it would just all be destroyed. I was very yeah. scared of him. And like you were just saying with, even with recovering grace, it's a multi-million dollar organization. They could crush me. Right. And I just was like, is it worth it? And at the time I thought, you know what? He didn't really do anything to me. So, you know, I'm, I just can't. So I actually, talked to a couple of the girls that were like roommates or housemates or friends with me at headquarters and helped them with stories to corroborate their stories. And even with that, after like an hour of doing it, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like I'm literally about to have a panic attack. Mm -hmm. And so I unfortunately was not involved in the lawsuit. um, And I think it actually was probably a very good idea for me um, to, because I was not strong enough until now for the documentary. Yeah. Uh, And and I mean, unfortunately that, um, that lawsuit was withdrawn ultimately. Well, I don't know if it was unfortunate, maybe. Uh, It it was, it was, you know, first first of all, just to clarify, Recovering Grace was kind of arm's distance from the lawsuit because we, we, we didn't want there to be that overlap. We wanted them to do their thing with their legal counsel Mm -hmm. and and do it. But I I will say, I will say this first and foremost, those women who, who went forward with that lawsuit are some of the most courageous women I know in the world, because like, like Lindsay said, they had a a lot to lose. They went through hell built. Uh I mean, Bill did put them through hell through, Uh through the discovery process. Um, and the things they went through and the, and the re-traumatization, uh. um, I mean, was, was just was just enormous. Um, but the reality is what they did, taking it public, filing right. a lawsuit, that was what made the, the world take yes. it seriously. You know, mm-hmm. it's one thing for this random blog out here to be saying these things. Yeah. It's another thing for there to be court filings and hearings and discovery and public documents where these allegations are spelled out and detailed. From um, 34 women. Uh, um, Yes. Well, the, the allegations are the, the numbers are probably actually double that the number of sure, women out sure, there. Yeah. But um, the lawsuit, I, th- I can't remember how many it was originally. It was eight, eight, somewhere between 10 and 20, I think, was the original. Like 17, I think. OK, yeah. yeah. Um, but but yeah, ultimately, just lot, lots of challenges, statute limitations. The, the, the lawyers were working on commission and they were just IBLP and Gothard were dragging this thing out forever. And once it got to a point where it didn't feel like there was a, a, a real path forward, they kind of had to shut down. And then as, mm-hmm. as we've learned, Bill basically count, not really countersued, but 
um, filed for sanctions. Correct. Trying to get money from um, these women. Um, he was denied that, and then yes. he appealed that. And it was that appeal that was the, the hearing where the women finally got to, uh, under oath, share the story. Mm-hmm. And the judge, you know, ultimately, the, the appeal was ultimately upheld. So. Yes, which so. was, uh, I mean, a huge validation right. for their stories, uh, right. which was yeah. phenomenal. So even though they had to to drop the lawsuit, uh, you know, yeah. they, they were, well, and, and, I think, validated. And the reality is, I, as I know, I've talked to a few of these women over the years is they, they were not in it for money. I mean, it was not about right. to, you know, sticking it to them. It was for the validation. They wanted someone to say, I believe your story. Right. Yeah. And they wanted it, you know, to be in the legal system. And ultimately in, in that appeal hearing, the judge basically said, I believe no. you, this is not a frivolous lawsuit. Here's the, here's the thing that is the most surprising and, and shocking to me is that, IBLP is still active at their new headquarters in in Big Sandy, Texas. Uh, Gothard's still out there. Uh, I wouldn't say he's nearly as prolific as he was, but he's he's still publishing. Uh, he had a birthday recently, and he gifted his staff with his newest book or or whatever it was that was his birthday present to everyone. Um, I've been checking eBay, man. I, can't. <laughs> I want an autograph. But yeah, I mean. It's still out there. And, and I think that's why this is so important to talk about. Yeah. Because the ideology, the teachings, the ministry is still out there. Um, and, and we've yeah. got to stay vigilant, let, making sure people know that yeah. this stuff is dangerous. Yeah. Uh, it will ultimately try to destroy you. Well, in IBLP, uh, um, I, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but they've rebranded the basic seminar or something called family conferences or something it's on there but they've totally renamed it but if mm-hmm. you look at the week-long schedule they're hosting the first one in big sandy in august really um but if you look at the outline of the week it's basically the seven basic principles road trip yeah. road trip <laughs> road. Yeah, there are, the family conferences it's on the web their website home discipleship network is what it's uh bundled underneath yeah, I thought about going, but I don't think they would sell a ticket to a John Cornish at this point. Yeah, probably so. not. They yeah, will remember me. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> Can you afford the therapy? Hi, I'm Graham Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I, we, we've we've had so many questions come through: uh, YouTube comments, emails, DMs, in person. People ask me questions in person, but I did want to get. I, I know that y'all probably have some questions, so I, I wanted to to let our, our studio audience ask questions first uh, or just make comments if, if that's what you'd like to do. If you're brave enough to come up here to the microphone so that everyone can hear you, would love for you to, but I think I think they can probably hear you pretty well just from back there. Um, so feel free to raise your hand if you've got a question or comment that you would like uh, to voice. In the back. Um, what advice would you give people as they work through the trauma of being mm. a former Yeah, so the question summarizing is, uh, how do you work through this trauma of being a former cult member? Um, what advice do I have? I don't know if I'm very qualified to give advice on that because I just did it with drugs. Uh, uh, that's, who I, that, that's, that's how I work through a lot of it. Uh, I just numbed everything out. Uh, I, you know, I don't remember the conversation I had with Bill Gothard, I think, just because I fried my brain so bad uh, you know, after getting out of the cult. But in, in all seriousness, I think, I think it's... A lot of it's conversations, uh, having conversations, talking to people that went through uh, uh, similar trauma, obviously talking to therapists, Mm -hmm. uh, but not being afraid to tell your story uh, and to get feedback from people who are qualified to give feedback. Um, You know, for a long time after I got out of the the cult, uh, the tendency was, oh, well, I'm going to go to a Bible based therapist. Uh, That did not help me at all. Um, either with my trauma or with, with my addiction struggles. Um, so I think conversations, uh, are the best way to start working through some of it early on just with people who understand and then ultimately therapy. I I don't know, John, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I was going to say step one therapy, step two therapy, step three therapy. (laughs) But, um, I mean, yes, therapy is huge. And that goes like what we said with the conversations, being able to talk to people. Um, I know for me, you know, finding those online communities, 10, 15 years ago, realizing that I was not alone mm-hmm. um, in these things. But the reality of trauma is it embeds itself in, in our bodies. You know, all the all the childhood wounds, whether it's from 
discipline from parents or from the teachings or through developing this view of, of God as this, this being who is just out to find your failures and squash you for them. Mm. Um, it, it takes years to kind of process so that we have to let it out. Yeah. And it comes out, um, you know, through, through therapy, through relationships, through for me beauty music is my is my drug of choice when it comes to be when it comes to beauty is, is finding peace and solace there mm -hmm. um uh, you know there there are certain songs i have to avoid because of um, <laughs> some I, of the old hymns bring back yeah, memories I, I can do without it. it will be worth it all you know <laughs> little, 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 um and a smile song is not a particular favorite of mine but it wasn't worth it all <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> I think I think the other big piece for me and, and one of the epiphanies that I had was acknowledging that that you actually did experience something traumatic. Yes, uh, that it really did happen. It wasn't normal. It wasn't OK, uh, because that's what a lot of people will tell you. I mean, Bryce talked about it in the final episode that we did. Uh, a lot of people just tell you it doesn't seem that bad. Get over it. You know, no, it's it's not a matter of just go, getting over it. It's a matter of working through it. Uh, Lindsay, did, did you have any other thoughts on that? Because that's a great question. I absolutely do. Um, I did not address any of this until 23 years after getting out. Um, I literally put it in a shoebox and put it up in a closet and didn't ever want to look back at it. Um, but during the pandemic, I read my journals from childhood up until the training center in Oklahoma. And I realized, holy crap, I have gone through hell. Um, and to be able to see it from such a far distance, but also realize that so much of what I was brought up with was literally in my DNA. Even though I was doing my career and, and successful at it, I was still following authority. I was still submitting to people. I was still like in this very weird, like programmed space for myself. That was pretty infuriating because I still realized I did not have my own voice. I was still yep. so programmed. So it wasn't until I moved out to California that I actually got into EMDR therapy, which mm -hmm. is, it is a crash course. It is really difficult. Um, I know a lot of people resist it at first because it sounds like way too much, but talk therapy, quite frankly, is not going to cut it for the type of trauma that we have been through. And I know a lot of people in ATI and IBLP that have gone through 10 years of talk therapy. And I'm not saying that talk therapy is wrong, but in uh, trauma informed therapy is very specific. And that's something that anyone that's looking for a therapist needs to be very uh, mindful of asking. Um, are you trauma informed? Do you understand religious trauma? Um, and getting into EMDR, I mean, you're getting into that REM space of your mind and you are able to actually heal yourself. And that's what's so mind blowing about it. I went through two years of this <laughs> to unprogram uh, my DNA, quite frankly, and I have never felt better. I have never felt freer. And I finally have a voice and I'm not afraid to use it. So um, I think people get a little bit um, tunnel focused in deconstruction, to be quite frank, where um, not that you can't get tunnel focused, but don't get so hung up on like the really tiny things at first. I think it's, you know, find your peace as you're working through this, like you said, acknowledging, call it a cult. Like that's the first thing when you go home tonight, if you've never said it before, look in the mirror and say very loudly, oh my God, I was raised in a fucking cult. <laughs> like do it, say it because, and then you're like, oh, I was raised in a cult, you know, and then you might sit on your floor in the bathroom and cry for an hour, but it's how it's so healthy to admit it. And I love what you guys are saying too about community and finding that community for yourself because collective trauma can also be be a healing space because we all four of us sitting here right now, I I haven't met you, Davey, in person. I haven't met you, John Cornish. I, I Brandon, you know, I gave you a hard time, but we, <laughs> we have not connected in like over 20 years. And yet I feel so comfortable talking to you because I already know, you know, the story. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, rely on each other and, and, and don't think you have to be afraid that people are going to tattle on you anymore and that they're not going to hold your secrets and your stories. You know, yep. we're, we're all coming to this collectively. So support each other as you also support yourself. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, sure. Great question. Thank you for the question. Uh, any, anyone else? Yes. That is probably the most common question <laughs> that I've gotten. Do you still consider yourself a Christian? Uh, I'll speak for myself. I still consider myself a Christian, uh, but I know a lot of people who would disagree with me uh, that would say, oh, no, you're, you're not really a Christian. Um, but, you know, you, you don't go to church every Sunday. Um, you don't take the Bible completely literally. Uh, you're, you're definitely not a Christian. And so 
while I consider myself one, yes, uh, I have my own personal faith. Um, and, and there would be a lot of conservative Christian types that would uh, argue that I am not. I am not one. I'm not what I say. Um, John, do you, are, do you feel comfortable answering that? Sure. Yeah. 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 So th the, the short answer is yes. Do I believe the same things that I believe believed 20 years ago? Absolutely not. Do I believe the things, same things 10 years ago, five years ago? No, it's been a process of, of I, I don't like the word deconstruction because it, it, get, it has a, a stigma to it now of like people assume if you're deconstructing, you're just throwing it all away. I like the yeah. disentangling. That's the new word. Yeah, yeah. That's the new hip word the kids are using these days. <laughs> um, but it sounds uh, sus to um, me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. For, for me, it's been a long journey of trying to discover who Jesus really is and who God really is. Mm. And it, there's been times when it's been a place of, but there's been a lot more of the the teaching, the, the biblical teachings and the and the garbage and just trying to hang on for dear life and yeah. find God in simple places like nature and, and, and music. Um, but slowly being able to rediscover and reconnect with who Jesus is as a person outside of all the extra, extraneous rules that, that yeah. Gothard um, brought upon us or even that the modern evangelical church sometimes mm -hmm. has adopted as what it means to be a Christian. Um, so. The answer is yes, and I assume there's people out there who would disagree with me as well, too. So, uh, Lindsay, I think you probably have a little bit of a different answer on this one, so I wanted to hear your thoughts. I do. <laughs> Before therapy, I identified as a Christian, but I didn't say anything to anybody. I was definitely a, uh, a non-church-going, pants-wearing, denim-loving girl. Um, but I, um, as I went through therapy, I started. I moved into theist, and then I moved into agnostic, and now I am happily an atheist. Um, but I, I hold space for for belief. I hold space for people that do believe. I, I don't hold that judgment because I understand faith for people. Um, but honestly, because of IBLP and ATI and my family, I've chosen that I would like to actually believe in myself for the first time ever. Mm. And I think that having faith in myself, I don't worship myself on an altar, but just be able to have faith and believe that I can get through this life, that I can be kind to others, that I can reflect. You know, some people may say, well, you're kind of, you know, trying to be like Jesus and like acting kind and loving and accepting and all encompassing with people um, and, and shining light on the bad. Um, just because I don't want to believe in a God and worship something doesn't mean that I cannot give forth goodness. So I'm atheist. I know that Christians can get bristly about it, but I'm like, I'm just a good person. I don't think anyone really, really blames you on that one, by the way, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think there's a lot of people that, that have had a similar experience with it as well. Uh, and, and that's kind of the cool thing about, you know, connecting with people that, that grew up in these, these or this cult and, and had these experiences because a lot of our experiences in the cult were very different. A lot of our experiences getting out in life after the cult has been very different and a lot of uh the ways that we view religion um has has become very different as well but at the at the end of the day we can all still support one another and, and identify with um you know uh, what our friends have, in, have experienced and, and not everybody can uh, necessarily understand what i'm going to say but i'm a dudist priest now so i just <laughs> Thank you, i just abide you can wear a bathrobe not wear a bathrobe drink a white <laughs> russian or not it's fine <laughs> Great question. Thank you. Any others from the studio audience? I know Bryce has a few queued up uh, from the YouTube, right? Uh, yes, we've got uh, we got some stuff coming in. And, okay. Uh, shout out to uh, Laura, who's watching. Oh, Laura Smith is in Hi, the chat. Hi, Laura. Lindsay knows Laura. I know Laura. Um Laura, if you could enlighten me as to what kind of conversation we had in my car after we went and saw a movie together, that would be so cool because I was wasted. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I knew Laura. And for those of you that don't know, Laura was uh, featured very prominently in, in the documentary as well. Uh, she did spend time in the prayer room, I believe. Uh, but I can't, I, can't, I think that was at Indianapolis. To yeah, probably, right? Uh, your opening statement. So you were in a prayer room. Do we have any? Uh, I, I, I know I saw a couple super chats come through, but I think it was more just kudos to recovering grace. Do we have any uh, questions with, with super chats on them, Bryce? It has been kudos. I did see something interesting, apparently, and I didn't know this existed. It, at the Indy Training Center, they had a pamphlet that would help you explain to people that you weren't in a cult. 
Somebody, I was like, what? I want to see this so bad. We need this. We need this document. I would love to see that one. Yeah. I, I know there was an article at some point in one of the one of the newsletters that talks about why ATI is not a cult and basically how to answer that question. So it, doesn't, it's probably, it could be the same document. I don't know. But there, there's been a concerted effort over the years to, to – non-identify as a cult well and there was actually a recent podcast that came out i'm not even gonna name oh, yeah. it or, or where it was but uh it was gothard endorsed because it was a lady talking about how she raised her kids in ati uh and it was not a cult even though she told her kids they had to check in with her every 15 minutes or something crazy like that did you watch that Lindsay? No, and I need the link. Stat. Okay. Yeah. I'll, uh... you, you can find that on Bill Gothard's Facebook page. So. <laughs> okay. Well, he, he recently wasn't it also on Discovering Grace because he's so brilliant <laughs> on discoveringgrace.org. He actually has a blog post out there too about how it's mm -hmm. not a cult. Yep. It doesn't surprise me. I try to I try to avoid discovering um, grace. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so uh, ridiculous. I refer to it as our satire it, site. It's pretty funny. Yeah. After recovering grace. <laughs> went crazy viral they established discovering grace <laughs> so that he could post his rebuttals and whatever the, he wanted the, the, to the there, crazy yeah. thing being like the design of it they like copycatted recovering mm -hmm. grace yeah. and mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's pretty funny he, he did he actually the guy who founded it um actually did that after we finally after years of tolerance of his comments on our website finally said no more and blocked him oh and, really and that's when yeah, he the, the butler yeah. The butler. Yes. Oh, yes. Gothard's butler. Yeah. 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 <laughs> His butler. Yes. We won't, um, we, won't, we won't name him on the Okay. Butler. Sorry. Back, back to you, Bryce. You got uh, you got any questions coming through on the uh, the live chat? For you. I'm looking for them. Uh, the good have, ones? <laughs> I'm, well, I'm looking for questions. There's a lot of, of people that are catching up and chatting and, and encouraging each other. And I see a couple mm -hmm. of friends. That's Hi, awesome. Rebecca. She uh, she served at Oklahoma City for a long, long time. I can if I close the, my eyes. The Rebecca. The Rebecca. If I close, can you hear this? Can you hear the skirt? If you close your eyes, no, nobody power walked in in a skirt like Rebecca's. <laughs> she had places to go and people to see. Let me tell you. Very diligent. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that is a great question. Actually, it's kind of surprising because you're the first person to ask that question as feedback uh, for the, the podcast. And uh, so the question was, have have any of our parents acknowledged that there was a problem with the way that that we grew up or, or even more so that it was a cult? Um, so it's interesting for me. Once again, I'll speak for myself here. Uh, the first time I mentioned that IBLP was a cult to my mother. She was like, well, it wasn't a cult. It wasn't, it wasn't really a cult. And I was like, well, then what would you call it? And my dad was like, it was a cult though, but it really, <laughs> but it was a cult, honey. Um, and I, I think it's almost, I feel like it's a quarterly event at this point where my mom will profusely apologize uh, for how we were brought up. Um, so she is, yeah, I've got a great relationship with my parents, uh, which I'm incredibly grateful for because I know that is not the experience that everyone has. Uh, there, there's been a lot of family members, you know, lost, uh, due to shunning or excommunication, uh, because of IBLP and, uh, and other fundamental religions. Um, but, uh, yeah, my parents, um, I think they, they are still very religious and, and they still hold to a lot of those same fundamental beliefs. Uh, but they definitely acknowledge that um, the ATI way of life was was damaging and, and, tra and traumatizing. Uh, what about you, John? Yeah, this is fun because my mom and dad are probably watching. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> love that. We we'll love a supportive parent. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so obviously, yes, they have they have um, come a long way since uh, the days in Gothard, and they have, they've they've sat us down and apologized more, more than once. Both my mom and mm. and dad um, acknowledging the the hurt we. We, we went through and and it's been a journey for them i'm proud of them my mom wrote an article for recovering grace so it's still still out there how cool um you, mm -hmm. can, you can i can't remember the title of it off the top of my head but it's, it's probably findable on there wow but, your own mother john wow yeah, unbelievable yeah so <laughs> um but yeah and you know i feel very blessed to ha have 
have them and be able to walk through this. And, and it wasn't that way at first. I was kind of the first one in the family out and it was some, there's some turmoil there for a bit, but yeah. I'm, gr I'm grateful for that. So. Bryce, do you want to comment on that at all? Um, I mentioned, I said it to my mom, it's like less than a year that it was a cult and she, she mocked me. So yeah, I, I haven't been back and, um, I, I, I still chat with my dad occasionally. He still texts me. Mom hasn't reached out at all. So, yeah. And I know this just, is one of the really tough parts of the conversation for you um, is the, the loss of relationship with, with family members that you want to have a relationship with desperately. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not the same for all of us. Not all, not all of our parents were as supportive as, as mine eventually became. And as, you know, John's art. Lindsay, did you uh, did you want to weigh in there? Yeah, I'm, I uh, I feel for you, Bryce, because my parents are similar in that, and um, I've been trying for decades to explain to them. They actually did not know about my uh, interaction with Bill Gothard until uh, April 22, um, because I just felt like it wasn't safe. It wasn't safe to tell them. They wouldn't have believed it, or they would have blamed me as being, you know, a promiscuous girl that would have led him down a path. And um, so, again, because of my intense therapy, I finally decided I'm writing victim impact statements to my parents. And they actually divorced many years ago. And so I wrote these letters and I called them out of the blue and I read them individually to them over the phone and then sent them a copy. And um, it, it was all the high points of the things that happened at home as well as what happened at headquarters, what I hold them accountable for as hoping that someday they could take ownership for. And then also leaving a lot of questions that if you would ever like to actually explain to me any reasoning for why you did choose to do this um, and also understand that you are victims of this man, but that doesn't totally assuage you from, it doesn't erase all of the guilt of the decisions that you chose to make outside of his own teachings. But um, it, it was hard. It was probably one of the hardest things I've ever to do, ever had to do in my life because I knew that this could be it. Like this moment could be the last time I ever have a connection with my parents. And um, my mother, that was a year and a half ago, most of my mother has not had said one word to me. Um, wow. My father, it took him about three months to write a letter I was hearing from people around him that he was actually terrified and really worried and concerned. But I honestly believe it was for himself and not about me as his daughter uh, being abused by Bill Gothard. And the letter that came back, I won't divulge everything, but it was it was disheartening for me because it was still without a lot of forth, uh, without a lot of heart to the fact that I was abused and still did not really take a lot of ownership. And so I was just like, I, there's nothing for me here. And I, I have to release it because this is actually still abusing my heart and hope is my Achilles heel at this point, because I keep hoping that at some point I will be able to get through to them and that they will understand in some way, shape or form. And I've actually been a lot freer by releasing them. I released myself too. So yeah. it's not easy at all. I'm not saying this because I'm just like so fabulous over here. It still guts me sometimes because I still feel like and realize that I actually had um, Stockholm syndrome after I wrote them because I still felt like I, I needed somehow to fix it. I, I messed it up and I need to repair the relationship. I messed it up. And that ownership, a lot of it comes from Bill Gothard's teachings that was in, that were ingrained in us. Yeah. So my heart goes out to you, Bryce. Thank you. Yeah, I, I tried to keep the peace and keep things together for many, many years. And, you know, my sister and I, we, we you know, we wanted her kids to have grandparents and it was fine up until the kids had, you know, personalities and their own wills. And then my my mother, you know, not agreeing with how they're being raised. You know, they, 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 my sister doesn't beat her children, so that's a problem. Um, <laughs> and there was just too many crazy incidents that were – it finally came down. I was like, we can't – this isn't repairable. And I was like, it's crazy. I and I, when I talked to them about this, my mother brought up this one incident that had happened like eight months earlier. And I was just, I looked her in the eyes like, you're holding a grudge against an eight-year-old. Yeah. Okay. Do you understand that that is crazy? And she would like, you don't understand. He, I was like, no, that, that, I don't care. Yeah. Who cares? It is your grandchild. Are you deciding now that your righteous indignation is what's more important than a relationship? And that was it. I was like, all right, cool. No, no holidays, no birthdays, 
no Christmas, no whatever. Every now and then dad calls me to come help him, you know, with some yard work or something like that. And I will go and I will help, but I did not make any kind of effort and it sucks. It sucks. Even though holidays and birthdays are infinitely better. <laughs> infinitely. <laughs> we get beer and bourbon and we just have a good time. And my sister's a badass. She can handle scotch straight. Yes, Aaron. I got drinking that scotch. So, no. All right. Yes. It, it. it does suck, but we have really reconnected with our other relatives that, you know, we were always kind of, they were isolated from us and, and we yes. didn't, mm -hmm. I've, we've missed out on so much with them. And now it's just like, we've just, we've just moved over and we go there for Thanksgiving and Christmas and it's wonderful. Yeah. And also my, my girlfriend's been crazy supportive during this whole time. Uh, and, there you go. and I, I want to thank her for that. A little girlfriend shout out. Because it has been it has been like we <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. That was a great, great question. Uh did you have anything else, Bryce, from the uh the live chat? Um I I saw something interesting. Does anyone else remember Gothard warning people about praying with the opposite sex because it builds intimacy? Oh, that's I don't remember that. Oh, okay. So one of our studio studio audience remembers that very specifically, uh, which is interesting because obviously that rule applied to everyone else, but not him, obviously. <laughs> uh, which is, I mean, pretty standard. Yeah, uh, it was all the rules. Very much. You know, repeat th that there. there's a very now that's a there's a very important question, Lindsay. Did you pray with this boy before or after you kissed him? Oh, because if it was before, then obviously we see where things are going. Yeah, no, we never prayed together. Our prayer was our lips going together. Uh, they were using those tongues for something else. No. Right? All right. We didn't even know that was an option, Davey. Come on. <laughs> was just closed mouth kissing? Oh. <laughs> they shouldn't have gotten I'm in trouble for that. You, it's the saddest, most innocent kissing you could have ever gotten in trouble for. <laughs> it's like preschool pecking. <laughs> oh. Okay, okay, so okay, wait, wait. And the kiss that Davey had in the elevator, was that also preschool pecking or was that slightly more advanced? Oh, there, there were there were more than mouths involved in my experience. Wow! Wow! Yeah, he went international. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm not surprised. I got the home plate. With my, wow! Uh, yeah. Uh, there's a question. Did the IVLP have any judgments for other fundamental denominations criticizing other denominations, or was that going against the business model? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Constantly. Oh, they would constantly criticize any other religion. Uh, especially Mormons, uh, they they loved pointing out how evil Mormons were, how sacrilegious it was because they didn't believe that Jesus was the true Son of God and had their own Bible. Uh, so yeah, they were constantly criticizing other religions. <laughs> I remember that Gothard said that Bob Jones University was way too liberal for us to attend. <laughs> In response, Bob Jones Senior called IBLP a cult. At least that was the rumor. <laughs> That's hilarious. And if anyone doesn't know what Bob Jones University is, incredibly conservative. Oh, yeah. Uh, but that's also probably because Gothard knew he wanted to establish Verity College, um, <laughs> which was an absolute joke, a joke of a school. Yeah. Bob um, Jones said, you've been served, and I don't think anything happened. Was, that's funny. Uh -huh. Well, y'all, I know we've been here. Uh, we've been here for a while, and, and I, I just wanted to say again how much I appreciated our studio audience being here for this live show in Austin, Texas. Thank you so much for everything. And of course, all the folks in the live stream, thank you for joining in. Thank you for, uh, for chatting, for watching, for being so supportive. Uh, the, my, my one takeaway from doing this series, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, Bryce can, uh, can corroborate here, but uh, it's just been incredible to see the outpouring of, of positive support. Um, it, it, you know, when, when Bryce and I decided to do this, it, it really was like, wow, the, the documentary didn't really talk a whole lot about, um, the cult itself. So let's, let's really dive in deep. Um, and I just never expected the feedback that we got. I, I, I actually expected a lot of, uh, you know, negative feedback, but overwhelmingly it's been just so incredible, incredibly positive. Uh, so thank you all for, uh, for the support, uh, John Cornish, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Lindsay, thank you for being here. 
uh it's just been so great getting to talk with you and and we'll have to uh we'll have to have some follow-up conversations maybe do a, yeah. a one-off episode or something and of course that. bryce you've been here the whole time thank you so much for uh for being here with me we've we both had some emotional breakdowns during this process <laughs> i told Lindsay that it was her part in the documentary that actually made me cry uh watching the documentary um and, and so, uh, it, you know, it's it's been uh, more challenging than than we thought it would be to do this. Uh, but Bryce has been has been right there uh, through the whole thing. So uh, thank you, and of course, thank you to producer Josh, who you can't see right now. He's he's kind of uh, <laughs> he's been awesome throughout this whole thing as well. Uh, but thank y'all so much for being here, um, and uh, and and thank you for 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 sharing. Thank you for for being a voice. Uh, exposing what happened here and, and helping us get the word out. Um, that's it. Thank y'all. Yeah.